Fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by that same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, St. Paul, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> All right, good morning, Sunday morning to everyone, and welcome to the last conference. And um, so this conference is entitled Toward Saint, and the description says, there is always a tendency to leave a retreat without a firm will to advance in the spiritual life after we get home. We close with a meditation on the devout life. Okay, so I'm going to focus on this necessary element in the spiritual life, and that is that firm will to advance in the spiritual life. All right? This desire for holiness. Again, the information that I'm using comes from Royo Marin's book, Theology of Christian Perfection, The Desire for Holiness. First of all, the, the nature and the necessity of this desire for holiness. Um, just by way of introduction, I'll read this little quote from St. Thomas Aquinas. It is said that when St. Thomas Aquinas was asked by one of his sisters what she should do to reach sanctity, he answered her in one brief sentence, will it, will it, okay? And that makes a lot of sense. So here we have a doctor of the church, the angelic doctor, answering his sister, how do I become a saint? And he answers with two words, will it? So that says a lot. That says a lot. Namely, it says this, that God wills our sanctification. We know this uh, from Scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4.3. So this is the will of God, your sanctification. So we know that God wants us to be saints. Then we can conclude that the only reason why we wouldn't become saints is if we didn't want to. Because, as I said yesterday, uh, no one or no thing can prevent us from becoming saints, from arriving at holiness. In fact, everyone and everything can and should be used as a uh, stepping stone to growth and holiness. So the only problem uh, with arriving at holiness is our own will. It's because at some point we say no and we backtrack. So that's really um, the, the crux of the issue, um, the point of this conference, okay? To have that firm will to grow in the spiritual life. The desire for holiness is an act of the will, something we can freely choose. But this choice and this act of the will, in order to desire holiness, uh, must be under the influence of grace, because this is supernatural. This is a supernatural end, uh, without which, uh, without the influence of grace, you just simply aren't going to desire that. Which aspires unceasingly to spiritual growth until death. Okay, so this desire must be present. And we'll talk about the different qualities of the desire. Um, one of them being constant. Okay, this constancy. The, the book of Revelation talks about the constancy of the saints. Sanctity is the supreme good which we can attain in this life. By its very nature, it is something infinitely desirable. 
But since it is also an arduous and difficult good, it is impossible to tend toward it efficaciously, that means bring it about really, without the strong impulse of a will which is determined to attain it at any cost. Key phrase there, at any cost. St. Teresa of Avila considers it of decisive importance to have a great and very great determined resolve not to stop without reckoning the difficulties along the way, the criticism of those around us, the lack of health or the disdain of the world. Therefore, only resolute souls with the help of divine grace will arrive. St. Teresa says that if there's not this will to arrive at holiness, no matter what the cost, and to have this disposition to um, do and undertake uh, whatever it takes to arrive at holiness, if we don't have that disposition, then in fact we will never arrive. It is impossible. So some qualities of this desire, it should be supernatural. That is, it should flow from grace and be directed to the greater glory of God, the ultimate end of our existence. We already talked about that as well. So that's our pure intention for why we want to be holy, to glorify God. This means that the desire for holiness is a gift from God, comes from above, for which we should petition humbly and perseveringly until we obtain it if we don't already have it. And so that's key, to pray for this desire, pray every day that our desire for Sanctity, uh, increase. It should be profoundly humble without reliance entirely on our own strength, which is weakness in God's sight. So this work of sanctification in the soul, our growth in the spiritual life, the life of grace and virtue, it's a two-way street. Okay, there's God's grace and help from above, and then there's our cooperation, our own personal effort from below. First and foremost, and above all, it is the work of God. Okay? This is supernatural. But at the same time, it requires something on our part. Placing our trust principally in him from whom all graces flow. So this humble disposition, this confidence in God is necessary. And it's necessary especially to fight against one of the principal temptations uh, which assail those who seriously put them on a path of sanctification. And that temptation is discouragement. Okay? To overcome discouragement, we need to be humble, not place our trust in ourselves, but all of our confidence in God, remembering that He wants our sanctification more than we do. And what is discouragement, really, other than a sign of pride? of relying on one's own strength and of being disappointed when we fail or demonstrate some weakness. That's where discouragement comes from. So that's not humble. One of the characteristics of the saints, of those who have their uh, cause for canonization before the church, one of the things they look for is did this person, did this individual ever show signs of discouragement? And as the Benedict the Fourteenth teaches, the saints never get discouraged because they're humble and their confidence is in God. Look at Saint Therese of the Child Jesus. Right? 
She said, her way is all confidence. And see, that confidence in God and placing all of her hope and trust in Him is then rewarded because, see, that makes her soul disposed to receive grace. That humble disposition and confidence in God opens the soul, and he can then flood the soul with grace, lights, and insights, so much so to make this young French woman a doctor of the church, master of the spiritual life. So that she arrives at understanding through the gifts of the Holy Spirit that everything is a grace, and that everything can be used as a stepping stone to greater holiness, and to arrive at the throne of God. Nor should we aspire to sanctity for any other motive than to love and glorify God. In the beginning, it is difficult to avoid every trace of presumption, zooming on our own strength, and egoism, that is, I want to be holy, so that others think I'm holy. It's often a trap as well, that vainglory to desire holiness more for um, you know, our own reputation rather than to really, well, for the glory of God, and to really be holy in His sight, holy and pleasing in His sight. So there can be this confusion uh, to seek to appear holy and to find affirmation in our holiness based on the response and uh, receptivity that we get from others. It's confirmation that we get from others. That's a big trap. Okay? It's a big trap. So... Not so much as in appearing holy or having this fame of holiness, but actually really being holy. And in the end, only God knows. You know? Only God knows. Again, per se, a soul in the state of grace already possesses a certain degree of holiness because God alone is holy. God alone is good. You alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. He alone is holy. And so his presence in the soul makes that person holy. There's no doubt about it. Anybody who is in the state of grace possesses a certain degree of holiness. Now, that degree... Uh, may not be such that the church is prepared to recognize it publicly and proclaim it uh, before the whole world as, as an example and a model. Okay? But because that holiness has not yet reached an eminent degree, the presence of God and the action of God in the soul has not become predominant. But that soul is still, notwithstanding it's in the state of grace, is still predominantly moved by its own thoughts, words, and actions, and inspirations, and uh, more or less an admixture of natural and supernatural motives. Okay, There's still a process of purification that needs to take place. But nevertheless, soul in the state of grace really does uh, have a certain degree of holiness because God is there. Okay, so we need to avoid presumption in our own strength, egoism, vainglory, impure motives, basically. Which God sometimes punishes by allowing the most shameful falls so that the soul will see exactly what it is when he does not sustain it. That is part of the process of purification. So there are the active purifications that we can do. Um, 
to mortify uh, vices and correct sins and uh, grow in virtue, but it's, it's really not enough to arrive at an eminent degree of holiness and to be guided predominantly by the Holy Spirit. So what then takes place is what's called the passive purifications, the purifications that God himself chooses. Okay? And those are painful. Those are painful. So our Lord talks about in the gospel, um, the good tree will bear good fruit, and my father will be the husband, husbandman who will prune that tree so that it bears more fruit. So it's that pruning process that hurts, that purification. And so there, there are the, uh, the night of the senses, that passive purification, this could become a long uh, discourse, probably another conference. But in any case, you know, humiliations and things like that, different trials could be interior trials, aridity in prayer, misunderstandings, uh, rumors about you, and things of that sort. Okay. It's all part of the passive purifications. Um, that the soul needs to abandon itself to God and continue to go forward and not go backward. But it is necessary to be constantly purifying one's intention and perfecting one's motives until they are directed only to the glory of God in conformity with His will. So our thoughts, our words, and actions need to be um, motivated by the love of God, the love of neighbor, genuinely seeking what is good for our neighbor, willingness to sacrifice ourselves to procure that good, and love uh, and this desire to glorify God with our lives. It should also be, so we talked about supernatural humble, it should be confident. This naturally follows from the preceding quality. Of ourselves, we can do nothing. The Lord already told us that. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But all things are possible in him who strengthens us. Philippians 4.13 so By ourselves, we can do nothing. With him, we can do everything. The Lord purposely places great obstacles before us in order to test our trust in him. So no surprise when you meet up with difficulties. No surprise. That's normal. This is what is so useful about reading the lives of the saints. St. Saint Maximilian says that we we tend to think that the saints were uh, much different than we are. He says, that's not the case. The saints were just like us, dealing with the same difficulties, the same weaknesses. Countless souls abandon the road to perfection, abandon the road to holiness in the face of obstacles because becoming discouraged and lacking confidence in God, they think that sanctity is not for them. Only those who persevere in spite of hardships will receive the crown of victory. St. Teresa of Avila says that the number one reason that souls, Christian souls, don't arrive at holiness is because in the face of suffering, that purification, those passive purifications, the great majority turn backwards. Little by little, they start to um, grow slack in prayer. The prayer life becomes less and less, diminishes the fervor with which they receive the sacraments, attention, reverence, and devotion at Mass. 
No. And slowly but surely, they seek to find that place of comfort you know, to escape the trials that God wants to purify them by. So it needs to be confident, predominant. This desire for holiness needs to be predominant. That means very much present. This should be our most intense desire, since there is no greater good than the glory of God, and as a means to it, our own holiness. All other goods must be subordinated to this supreme good. So everything in our lives should be ordered toward that end. Hence, the desire for holiness is not simply one among many, but it must be the fundamental desire which dominates one's entire life and motivates and informs and animates all the other uh, decisions that we make. Those who wish to become saints must dedicate themselves to this task professionally. And this requires that they put aside anything that may prove an impediment. Many souls have failed in the pursuit of sanctity because instead of giving themselves irrevocably to its pursuit, they have fluctuated between the things of God in the things of the world. See, that's that fickleness of man. One day hot, one day cold. This is uh, Ecclesiasticus 27.12. I can bring that up real quick. Maybe we don't have an inter internet connection. I don't know. We'll see. A holy man continueth in wisdom as the sun, but a fool is changed as the moon. See that? You can't be so changeable and, you know, be moved by the wind and the waves, but we need to be constant. So they have fluctuated between the things of God and the things of the world. And that's actually a terrible state to be in. St. Teresa of Avila talks about that too. How the soul that fluctuates between the things of God and the things of the world lives a miserable life. They have one foot in heaven and one foot in the world. And the reason why they're so miserable is because they're not generous with God. They're not willing to give Him everything. And so because they're not generous with God, God is not generous with them. And so they don't enjoy divine intimacy and the consolations that God gives to generous souls. But at the same time, they don't want to be damned, so they don't give themselves over to the pleasures of the world. And so they just live in this state of tension and misery. So we want to be all in, as they say today, right? So it should also be constant. Numerous souls on the occasion of some great event, such as the termination of a retreat, okay? reception of, religious, of the religious habit or sacred orders, profession of vows, experience a great spiritual impulse. There's this sensible fervor, right? As a result, they resolve to dedicate themselves henceforth to the pursuit of sanctity. And hopefully that intention is present there and that fervor is present at the end of this retreat. But let's see how it is a month from now when you're back into the daily grind. So that's why it needs to be renewed every day. But they soon weary of the pursuit when they experience the first difficulties. And they either abandon the road to sanctity or the ardent desire becomes cool. Or sometimes they grant themselves vacations. 
vacations in the spiritual life and pauses <laughs> under the pretext of resting a while to recover their strength. <laughs> this is a great mistake because the soul not only does not gain any strength, but is greatly weakened. Later, when it wishes to renew its efforts, a greater effort is required to recapture the spiritual gains previously made. No vacations. All this could have been avoided if the desire for holiness had remained constant, without respite or weakness. Okay, number six. It should be practical and efficacious. So this is not a question of wishful thinking. Oh, I would like to become a saint. Wouldn't that be nice? But we're talking about a definite determination which must be put into practice here and now. And see, that's the thing. I think sometimes it happens that we have ideas that, you know, our sanctity will arrive kind of later. No. Here and now, really, today. We need to start today. Loving God with all of our strength. By using all the means at one's disposal for attaining perfection. It is easy to imagine that one has a desire for perfection because of an occasional good because of occasional good intentions or certain noble sentiments experienced during prayer. But a desire is efficacious only when it is put into execution. To desire perfection or holiness in a theoretical way and to postpone one's efforts until some later date is to live in an illusion. The individual passes from one delay to another and life passes on, so that the person runs the risk of appearing before God with empty hands. So, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Today is the day of conversion and grace. So, how do we acquire this desire? Means of developing, maintaining, and increasing this desire, prayer and meditation. Okay, since the desire is supernatural, it can come to us only from above. For this reason, we must pray and ask for it. And we must meditate frequently on the motives which inspire this desire. The principal motives are the following. Number one, God is worthy of it, to say the least. We cannot love God enough. We need to be very aware of that. And that's mentioned, uh, where is that mentioned? In um, Continue to praise him and you will never arrive. What, what book of scripture is that? Uh, something like... Uh, he is always more. Um, so I think it's from the wisdom literature. Okay, it talks about the greatness of God. We can praise him as much as we can, and we will never arrive at what is worthy of him. But we should also know this, is that because we are incorporated into Christ, see, this is our great consolation, when the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, He gave to God a glory that was worthy of God uh, in the strict sense of the Word. Okay? So the God-man renders to the Father that glory, that honor, that love, which is worthy of the Godhead in the strict sense of the Word. And so, this is a wonderful thing for us because we are incorporated into Christ. And so, in a certain sense, we can participate in that, and I say especially at Holy Mass. Okay? 
the holy sacrifice of the Mass renders to God a glory, uh, an infinite glory. And we can unite ourselves with that prayer, with that offering, and that's what really satisfies a heart that loves God and wants to love God uh, with a love and, of which he is worthy. There is our satisfaction. There is our consolation. In participating in Mass, God receives all the glory uh, of which he is worthy in the strict sense of the word. So God is worthy of it. You know, we need to meditate on that. That he is worth my loving him with all of my strength. Number two, we have an obligation to strive for holiness. Our Lord said, Matthew chapter 5, verse 49, the Sermon on the Mount. Be you therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, the church understands those words as meaning we have the obligation of striving for perfection. And we also need to realize that we cannot arrive at absolute perfection, but we can arrive at a relative perfection. And this is another wonderful thing, is uh, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that the soul has arrived at a relative degree of perfection when it is loving God as much as it can. So, and that, that relative perfection uh, that we arrived at should grow from day to day. But think about this. Today, you can arrive at a relative degree of perfection by loving him as much as you can. Today. Holiness starts today. And then that path is just going to continue day after day, and it should be one of continual growth. And normally speaking, it is gradual. Normally speaking, the individual soul does not even observe or notice growth that is taking place. But it's not uncommon that others do notice, especially if some significant time has passed since they last saw you. So today, you put yourself on a serious path of striving to love God with all of your strength. And then, you know, you see uh, somebody who knows you well, sees you in 10 years, and they notice a difference, whereas you haven't noticed anything. And a lot of times, when there is growth, God doesn't want you to notice anything. So as to avoid the temptation to pride. And a lot of times the spiritual director will notice what God is doing in your soul and you think you're going backward. So really it's just important to maintain that desire and, and stay on the path. And trust in God. Confidence. Consciousness that this is the greatest good we can seek in this life. This is the greatest thing. I wrote down below. We need good reasons. Love of God, God wills it, it gives him glory. Love of neighbor, it is the best thing you can do for your neighbor. The apostolate, the church, the world, there is nobody more useful than the saint. Because God is dwelling in that soul and he is present there, and where God is, there is good fruit. You're going to produce and be an instrument for good in this world and in the lives of others. So it is the best thing that you can do. Then, love of self. There is a proper love of self. Because we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. We need to love ourselves. That is an ordered love of self. And a proper love of self is to desire our holiness. That is not... Uh, egotistical. Why? Because it's according to truth. That's why we're here. That's what God made us for. So to desire to grow in the life of grace and virtue and holiness is according to truth and is 
is not uh, prideful in and of itself. Now, it could be prideful and egotistical if it's to draw the attraction and praise of others. But just in and of itself, it's a good thing, it's well-ordered, and all the rest. It is the best thing you can do for yourself to arrive at a relative happiness in this life. Think about this. We are made for heaven. We know that ultimately the desires of our heart can only be filled in heaven because we desire a joy that fully satisfies and that never ends. This, this applies to everyone because God made everyone. And so nobody would reject that, a joy that fully satisfies and then never ends. And that consists in the beatific vision, knowledge of God, face to face, loving him with our entire being and being filled with his love, this union with God. That's what makes us uh, beatified, it is fully happy. So in this world, the greatest happiness that a person can experience in this world is a foretaste of that next world, which is given, from, which comes from God. So the more God is present in the soul, our knowledge of God, our union with God grows, that veil of faith becomes ever more thin, and our love for Him is more intense, and so there we really are having a foretaste of the heaven which awaits us, and the soul is filled uh, with happiness, the greatest happiness that can be experienced on this earth. But notice, it's not full, and it's not endless, okay? Those experiences, those foretastes of heaven, they come and go. There is a relative happiness in this life, as long as we're here in this world, we are always wayfarers. Okay? But again, it prepares us for the next life, which is complete and endless happiness. And not to mention, holiness is good for our entire being. The life of virtue, the life of grace, is good for us not only spiritually, it's good for us physically and psychologically. The presence of God in the supernatural life has a um, healing effect on our entire being. So it is desirable uh, under every sense of the word. Okay. Awareness, finally, awareness of the danger we risk if we do not truly strive to sanctify ourselves. There's always that uh, no stability in the spiritual life, either going forward or going back, backward. So if you're not striving, okay, you're going to be going backward. And that's a big risk, a big danger. So for all of these reasons, you know, we should meditate on that. We should meditate on it to inspire us and to strengthen our wills in this pursuit. And finally, uh, Frequent renewal. So prayer and meditation, and also frequent renewal. How frequent? Every day. Since the evil of the day is sufficient unto itself. We should renew this in the morning to prepare ourselves spiritually for the day. And that's very easy. In your morning prayer, you know, shortly after you wake up, you say, today, I want to love God with all of my strength, with all of my heart, with all of my mind, with all of my soul, that's why I'm here. That's the only thing I really have to do today. The rest is secondary. The rest is secondary. And then we ask for the grace, of course. We ask our Lord, our Lady, to help us to do that, to make it practical and efficacious. And I will say this, if you do that every day, you renew that desire, you ask for the grace, you will infallibly arrive at holiness. Infallibly. 
Because as I said before, God wills it much more than we do. Okay, so at this point, uh, maybe we can get the microphone if there are any questions. Yes, Pamela, Pamela, your name's Pamela, right? I'm interested in you just talk, talking about the difference between feelings and will, about the loving. You know, sometimes, right. you know, um, we, we want to love God, but feelings might not be there. So would right. you talk about that? That's very important, and that's um, something that's very much present in the writings of St. Maximilian Kolbe, but also in St. Thomas, is that Love, of course, charity is essentially an act of the will. It's a choice. For this reason, our Lord can command us, require us to love our enemies. Because it's a choice. If it wasn't a choice, then he couldn't command it of us. So, for example, the feelings, um, sin, one of the effects of original sin is that a disorder... Is, has now entered into our human nature, and the lower faculties of our soul, okay, our sensibility, our passions, emotions, feelings, are not under the complete dominion of right reason and our free will. There's been this disconnect. So now we actually struggle to get those passions ordered properly. You know, we know the right thing. We want to do the right thing. Why is it I don't feel that? Or why is it difficult? Or, you know, I feel aversion for that which I know I ought to do. Or I feel warmth and attraction toward that which I know I should avoid. Okay? Because the passions, the sensibility is not under the complete dominion of our right reason and, and enlightened by faith, and our free will. And so for this reason, this is part of the cross. When our Lord says, take up your cross and follow me, this is part of it, is that, that tension that we find within ourselves. And this is part of the struggle for holiness and is part of the ascetical life and mortification. All that comes into play. So, for example, uh, with regard to this desire for holiness, as I said, as I read, it's very common at the end of a retreat that there is sensible fervor. You know, you're just kind of on a spiritual high and all revved up and ready to go. Okay? And that's a good thing. That's good because that passion, that uh, good emotion and feeling helps, helps us. It energizes and assists the will, in then making good choices. It's a good thing. We should be happy about that. But it's not necessary, strictly speaking. It's not essential. In other words, that sensible fervor, if it's not present, for whatever reason, right? We're human beings. Sometimes a low pressure system passing through is enough. And guess what? I'm feeling kind of down. Don't really feel like being a saint today because there's a low pressure system coming through. <laughs> and so, you know what? No problem. Because I can choose to be a saint even if I don't feel it like it. I can choose to be faithful to my duties. I can choose to be patient with this person even if I don't feel like it. And so that's really the will is very important. Now, at the same time, we don't want to reject the emotions and the passions. That's part of our human nature. And as much as we can, we should try to cultivate sensible fervor to become saints. You know, we should try, by the use of our will and by the use of our imagination. So our thoughts, you know, you've heard of that, the power of positive thinking, okay? Our imagination, those really do have an effect on our emotions. So we need to, sometimes if we're not feeling fervor or if we're feeling anger or whatever it may be, we should have a look. Hey, what am I thinking about? What's going on in my imagination? 
how much am I at fault for what I'm now feeling and what is making my good choices difficult? Okay, so we do what we can and with the help of grace um, and um, notwithstanding, if we're doing the best we can and, uh, you know, God has kind of left us in this place where the feelings are not really cooperating, well, then we just need to be patient and just, you know, offer that to God. Normally speaking, as uh, growth and holiness takes place, the passions become more ordered, right? It becomes easier. They, and adverse passions become less frequent and less vehement, normally. Another question? Yes, Father. Uh, sometimes aridity in prayer after uh, fervency and experiences in, in the spiritual life happen. Some, 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 it seems like sometimes aridity is a common next step for some of my situations in my spiritual life. So, and you just commented about patience. Uh, what should, should it be perseverance and prayer immediately or should there, should there be fasting immediately? Because I've heard sometimes fasting, beginning, of, beginning to fast immediately with prayer immediately, sometimes a, a good answer, or is it, is it just simply being patient right. with continuing more de a deeper prayer? Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the counsel, in a situation like that, the counsel uh, is going to vary from person to person. And see, this is the importance of having a spiritual director who is following you. You know, and keeping track of what God is doing in your soul, where you've been, where you are now, what your progress is like, what's going to be most helpful. Um, but in general, I would say this, is in general, anybody who wants to um, you know, seriously make progress in the spiritual life, some degree of fasting should be present. You know, the church... The church requires from us a bare minimum to keep the spiritual life alive. That is, to keep us in the state of grace. Uh, but the church doesn't require things uh, that will make us holier, also because those things are going to vary from individual from individual. So we know for our salvation, the church has lined up certain things for our salvation. Uh, the attendance at weekly mass, okay, holy day, Sundays and holy days of obligation, confession at least once a year, receiving the Holy Eucharist at least once a year, fasting on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. These are bare minimums because the gospel requires these things, right? Unless you do penance, you shall all likewise perish. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. So these things the church establishes a, as a bare minimum. What's interesting is in the uh, handbook or the manual for indulgences, I forget which one the most recent copy is called. Um, it's either the handbook or the manual. One was printed after the other. But it's interesting in that manual for indulgences, you kind of get more of a sense of the mind of the church of what is Ne necessary or extremely useful for growth in holiness. Because here we're not talking about things that are obligatory, but we're talking things that are above and beyond that which is necessary. And uh, so the church talks about things like forgetting an indulgence, um, confession uh, 20 days before or after the work worked, you know, which is indulgenced. So that kind of gives you an idea of the mind of the church that kind of the ideal is that souls be going to confession once a month, you know, or once every three weeks. You know? 
It's kind of the mind of the church. Uh, and then the, the indulgent, uh, indulgence works like the rosary, reading scripture. You know, then you get an idea of what's really useful for making progress in the spiritual life. All right, one more question. Uh, you mentioned about starting the day in prayer, asking for that grace to become holy. Mm -hmm. Do the saints have anything? Is there anything recorded by what some of the saints prayed in the morning or what their favorite way of invoking that grace? It's always fun to pray at the saints. Sure. I just didn't know if you were aware of anything. Um, nothing comes immediately to mind. Does anybody else uh, know of anything? Morning prayers by the saints? Okay. Microphone? Can you get the microphone? Uh, I'm not an expert on it, but Jose Maria Escriva suggests the, uh, the power minute, and so you wake up and immediately jump to your knees. I, I, I don't do it, but maybe I, this is the occasion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a, That's I have a lot of friends. That's good humility. That, That's good humility. Yes. Um, but, um, and immediately dedicate yourself to God. I think the image of like seeing the enemy uh, and like, preparing your battle against him for the day and, and knowing that God is behind you is, is really um, useful that I've heard that uh, for the Opus Dei uh, particular community, um, they, uh, it's a really powerful way. If you look more into Jose Maria Escriva, Saint. Jose. His feast day is tomorrow, by the way. Mm -hmm. And St. Paul's Street Evangelization also publishes a wonderful little prayer pamphlet called My Daily Prayer, and it also has morning prayers. So, uh, Father, you know, a couple of people were asking, and I think they felt a little embarrassed to, to ask, who are the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate, and what is a friar? You know, maybe we should have covered that right at the, the very Probably, beginning. Probably, yeah, that sounds like... Could you tell like, us about, about... That sounds uh, like introductory material. Yeah. We're going in reverse order here. Uh, so, a friar refers to a religious, somebody who professes the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, obedience... Uh, and who belongs to the mendicant orders, either the Franciscans, the Dominicans, but also the Carmelites are called friars. Uh, you know, and there's a distinction between a friar and a monk. Okay, a monk is somebody who lives within the monastery, whereas a friar is someone who also goes out and does apostolate. Okay? So that's what a friar is. Now, a Franciscan friar of the Immaculate we started in, uh, we were founded as our own institute in 1990 in Italy. Our founder was an Italian, Father Stefano Manelli. And the inspiration was basically after the council, Pope Paul VI asked all religious to look to their founders and to be faithful to the charism of their founders, but to live it in the modern context. So obviously, for Franciscans, we're looking at St. Francis as our founder, and we want to be faithful to the charism of St. Francis, but we want to live it in the modern context. And so our founder, Father Stefano, saw in St. Maximilian Kolbe the, a, an, um, a great model of how to live the Franciscan charism authentically in the modern world. And so that was our desire, was to model our form of Franciscan life after the uh, example of St. Maximilian Kolbe. And in fact, St. John Paul II called St. Maximilian Kolbe the St. Francis of the 20th century. So. All right. Uh, do, we have, do we have time for one more question? Or? Sure. Okay. Yes. I had a question. Yeah. yeah, I raised my hand. Um, anyway, uh, earlier you mentioned that uh, with him we can do everything. Without him we can't do anything. Yes. And I was thinking about when is the with him. So before we're baptized, we don't have sanctifying grace. Right. In mortal sin, we don't have it. Right. So I'm, I'm kind of asking that concept are we about the with him. Right. Are they not with him? Or are they with him to some degree? I think we're with him if we're in sanctifying grace and growing a holiness. Yes. But, yeah. yeah, that scripture passage, uh, meaning with him, means united to him. Just like in the gospel, it talks about um, the vine and the branches, right? 
So being grafted onto Christ, when we're baptized, we are grafted onto Christ. We are the branches grafted onto the vine, and that life-giving sap, which is sanctifying grace, is now present within us, okay? So that means being with him. And being with him, uh, we can do good works which are meritorious towards eternal life, okay? If we commit mortal sin and we lose the life of grace, we are not with him in that sense. And not being in the state of grace, your good works that you perform, because you can still do good works if you're not in the state of grace, but guess what? No merit for eternal life. They are not meritorious in God's sight and are not meritorious towards your salvation. That's what it means, okay? You can do nothing meritorious apart from him. Now, that doesn't mean that the person who's in the state of mortal sin should not do those good works. They should because what they, that now serves as a preparation for getting back into the state of grace. It disposes them to receive once again God's grace. Father, and I thought we only had one more question. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, in a previous confer- conference, you mentioned um, about how thoughts were, uh, could be sin. Yes. Um, could you, without any other explanation, and um, it seems to me that this is a very um, a topic among Catholics that is not discussed oh. um, in most parishes or, or uh, in general context. So I think there's a lot of confusion here among how th- and when a thought becomes a sin. Right. So can you discuss uh, briefly the, the, uh, about when a thought becomes a sin when the will is engaged, when a choice is made versus a thought that comes to mind before the will is engaged. Right. Yeah, well, I think the most common sinful thoughts are probably impure thoughts, uh, which there is willful consent for the sake of obtaining illicit pleasure. Our Lord says in the gospel, if you so much as look at a woman and desire her in your heart, you have already committed adultery with her. Okay? That's truth himself who is speaking. And again, that makes sense, too. I mean, really, when you think about it, uh, even though it's difficult. Eh, Difficult, but not impossible. So that means that, you know, when when that temptation, here we want to, of course, distinguish between temptation and sin. It's not a sin to be tempted. Actually, to be tempted can be occasion, an occasion for our spiritual growth and our merit, a growth and our greater merit. So that's why God permits temptations. So the tempting thought comes to mind. Now, remember, you need to be, have sufficient awareness that it's sinful and you should not be thinking that. And so at a certain point, you're going to become aware of that. You're going to be like, whoa, yeah, I shouldn't be thinking about that. And then the will needs to make a decision. I'm either going to continue to think about that for the sake of obtaining pleasure, or I'm going to reject it. Now, practically speaking, what should you do? What is an an objective sign that you did not give consent? And this is what St. Alphonsus Liguori teaches, is if you invoke the Blessed Virgin Mary. So that's the first thing you should do. You're aware of that thought, shouldn't be thinking that, And then, you know, you do the best you can to find a distraction, occupy yourself with some, uh, you know, occupation, you know, or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's also possible that that thought, which is a temptation, could persist and be very uh, bothersome. But you continue to pray, you continue to find a strength, and you just be patient until 
God decides to, to take it away. So, you know, I suppose another thought, uh, well, you know, I guess I'm, I'm thinking now of hatred, you know, it's an internal sin, but it's not really a thought as much as an act of the will. You, know, you, you hate somebody. You willfully hate them and you wish them evil. You know, that's another, but that, that's not so much thoughts as it is, uh, you know. Although I suppose the angry thoughts kind of lead to that hateful will. Is there uh, anything more on that topic? Right. Right. Sure. Right. Remember, even prior to the thought, the will can make a decision to introduce the thought. If you go online looking for images which are going to give you bad thoughts. So the will has already made a sinful decision prior to the thought. So that's possible too. Okay. Well, right. thank you, Father. You're welcome.